Right. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm Grace. I'm Jose. Good morning. Nice to meet you. Good morning. <laughs> for me, it's good nice. morning. For you, probably it's good night. Okay. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> where, where are you from? Uh, where um, are you from? I'm at Stanford University School of Medicine. Stanford, okay. So. Now, for you, it's good night. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you located? Are you in? In Barcelona. Oh, in Barcelona. Okay. Oh, great. Yes. Great. For for me, it's, it's, it's seven in the morning. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> or you at twelve or something like that? Uh, ten o'clock. It's not too terrible. Ah, ten, ten o'clock. Yes. Did you? Um, are you colleagues with Dean Miner, Doctor Miner? No, uh, I met. Uh, um him a few days ago when we make a rehearsal and was the first time that we meet together all of us oh wonderful uh, we prepare a rehearsal about this uh, meeting and then uh, it was the first time that i met him but he said he has sent uh, 
several information about the, the panel. And here we are, ready to go. <laughs> And uh, what do you do, what do you do? Um, it says your uh, institute of multidisciplinary research. Yeah, well, not it's a, the the real name actually is the Institute of International Relations. Uh, it's oh. a very old name uh, because I'm uh, I'm several things. I'm I'm a physician, but retired professor in the university. And actually, I work for the Barcelona Supercomputing Center as a strategic advisor, and uh, mm -hmm. also. I am the president of an institution inside the Royal European Academy of Doctors, who is an organization who uh, group doctors from all the fields, from coming from Europe and other parts of the world. And then we have 20 Nobel laureates, etc., in, uh, and on the on the group. And then I am the president of a part of this uh, institution. Oh, wow. uh, the, the name that appears on the on on the list is uh, is wrong because it was. Uh, uh, originally is another is another um, charge, but uh, actually I am the the president of the Institute of International Relations, and also the uh, my paid job is a, a strategic advisor as a Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Oh, okay. And um, have you been doing work on COVID vaccines or work related no, no, to COVID? No, no, no. no, only in theoretical uh, aspects of COVID. Uh, in fact, I was interested on COVID uh, from the beginning as a public health uh, <laughs> uh, uh, professor, although was a, a retired professor. But hello, good morning. Right. Oh, good, good, afternoon. Right. good evening for you. <laughs> uh, and, but well, uh, I'm not only interested in the uh, on the way of the this uh, topic because actually I'm working in other topics, but as I was invited to join because uh, the organizer of Horasis is a good friend and normally he invites me to talk about this kind of issues and then okay. Oh. I, uh, <sighs> so you've attended this meeting before. <laughs> yes. Yes. In, uh, there, if the meeting that was originally in in Portugal in oh, Astoria. Okay. Speaking. Hello. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hang on a second. Oh, I'm God. guessing you're Brett. <laughs> yes. Well, this is a is that any better? meeting. Yes. Yes. Terrific. At least How are you guys today? Yes. <laughs> you, can you hear me okay? Yes. 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 Where are you located? In New York City. And yourself? Oh, we're in New York. Okay. Oh. It's really late. Wait. Yeah, it's late. It's, it's early. Well, early. Late, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, New York, here, what time is it now? One, one or two p.m.? One a.m. One o'clock. One o'clock in the morning. One o'clock. Okay. Not so bad. And and where are you guys calling from? Uh, I am from Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Very good. I'm calling from Palo Alto, California. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's what, 11 o'clock out there, roughly? Uh, 10 o'clock. We're good here. Okay. All right, right. right. <laughs> 10 o'clock is not so bad. <laughs> mm. Well, good. So how are things in Barcelona? Uh, well, it's nice, uh, and, and now it's, we st are starting with a little bit of cold, not too much, because here is not the, the weather is not bad. But actually, it was uh, announced some uh, rain and uh, windy days uh, this for coming days. But well, it's nice. It's, uh, Barcelona has a very nice uh, climate in general. It's a um, soft Mediterranean climate. It's nice, it's, uh, and the things here is. Uh, Complicated as all in the old part of Spain, we have a lot of problems uh, with um, uh, COVID uh, people who are uh, infected and reinfection. It's uh, coming now. Apparently, the last few days uh, has been stopped a little bit, but well, the situation is still complicated, and we still most of the time. For example, in my case, most of the time is still at home. Mm. Oh. How are things in New York? You guys, it seem like you're actually 
Well, doing better than you were in the spring. <laughs> yeah, but that's not saying very much because we weren't doing yeah. so. Well. Um, it's yeah. It seems like it's coming back to life. I mean, I, I work in I live in Midtown. I have work down in Soho, mm -hmm. um, and you're starting to see. You know, they've opened up the restaurants on the streets, so now mm -hmm. they can't serve indoors. So they're they're serving outdoors. And now that the weather is good, you know, it's it's quite it's quite a dynamic environment. Um, the problem, of course, is going to be when the starts the weather starts to get cold. Mm -hmm. uh, whether they can go back indoors or not. So I think that's mm -hmm. really a big threat. Um, now, but basically, we're, you know, it's been a tough time in New York. I mean, the, uh, it's uh, it's been like a ghost town since, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. it hit, you know. And um, But I, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful. Hopeful things will start getting getting back to normal. How about Palo okay. how Alto? How's, how are things there? Um, we're doing okay yeah. right now with COVID. Yeah. Um, but, you. Oh. <laughs> but um, the you know the air quality has been on and off because of the wildfire. I think that's been, that's been hard because you know you have to go outside with COVID, but then the wildfires keep you in. So, oh wow, right, you have a double whammy. <laughs> yeah. what, what kind yeah. of work? I mean, we were lucky; we didn't get displaced, but there's some families that got displaced. So it's been really, I think, hard for them mm -hmm. uh, during this time. But. Today was a good day. <laughs> what, what kind of work do you do in uh, Palo Alto? I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician. So I work at, um, I'm a professor of pediatrics. I work at uh, Stanford Children's Health. I'm the associate chief medical officer there. And then um, I work a lot on, or I think a lot about COVID vaccines. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Well, was I'm sorry? Are you, are you feeling positive about the future of, for treatment? Um, for treatment? Uh, well, I'm feeling, I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling cautiously optimistic. I'm nervous a little bit about the vaccines, you know, given all the, all the craziness that's been going on. But, um, but I do feel optimistic that as soon as the data come out and we can review that data, we'll have a much better sense of how to optimize the use of, of those vaccines. So. I do think we can get there. Well, that's helpful. So the one thing I've been sort of wondering about is, you know, the, the like HIV, you know, a vaccine for HIV. I mean, it seems like we've been mm -hmm. trying for a long time for one of those. Um, is that comparable? I mean, is it possible for us to get something quick when we've struggled or still long for that, for the HIV? Oh, for HIV specifically? Well, yeah. As an example, that's one that we spent a lot of time and money on and still – not much. Yeah, you know, I think, well, I'm more hopeful for the um, COVID vaccines in part because there's, I feel like, you know, the portfolio is so diversified that I think, uh, and there, the, the trials are coming along so fast. I can't believe how large these trials are and how quickly they've enrolled. So, I, you know, given the, what I've seen on the phase one, two data and they, you know, they publicly published that, uh, it does seem promising, and I think, you know, we'll see what the phase three trials show, but we still have to, we're still waiting for those phase tr three trials to be reviewed by the FDA. So we'll know more soon, I hope. Mm. Hello, everyone. Can can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. How come I can't see you? <laughs> can't you, well. you can't see me? No. Uh, can you see yeah. us? <laughs> yeah, I can see you. Maybe your camera's not on. Yeah, no, my camera's on. I can see the, the green light. Um, huh. This is very odd. All right, let me call them back. I also see Fahim is on, but I can't see him either. Yes, I see, yes, I see Fahim on my screen as well. Where are they? Hi. Hi. So they can hear me, but they can't see me, the other panelists. I can see them, but they can't see me. Um, did you turn on the access of your camera? Yeah, I see that my green light's on on the camera. And I can see myself. I can see myself in the box, but they can't see me. I see. Oh, wait. Let me just see if there's a... No? 
give me one second. Uh, I will open the. I had the same problem yesterday with my computer. I need to turn off the computer and start again because my camera was also disappear and I was unable to. Hi, man. <laughs> Hello, me. We can see men. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay, awesome. For some reason, I, I, I thought I was meeting. Hi, everyone. Hello. 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 Everybody. Hmm. Man, this is Lloyd. Uh, we're, we're trying to work on I can see you, but evidently you no one can see me, so we're trying to work on that. Yeah, we really? also can't can see Fahim for some reason. Yeah, we also can't and I can't see Fahim either. Okay. Well people can hear you, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. let, let me call one of our engineers or call you back very soon. Okay, yeah. thank you. Grace, you are you are a pediatrician in Stanford. Yes. But you are also a member of the CDC advisory committee, no? Yes. On immunization practices, yes. Correct, yes. <laughs> I have it's a, a old, old friend of me was uh, working there as a pediatrician for Atlanta, Dr. Fernando Cordero. Uh, he was working, I think he was a, one of the founders of this, uh, uh, was a long time ago because I was at CDC 30 years ago. Oh, wow. But I originally was a pediatrician also. Oh, you were. <laughs> but probably the last uh, ch child that I have attended now, they have grandsons or something like that. But. <laughs> 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 oh, so you were at CDC. You probably have I you been at, back to I, the new campus? I was at, I was at CDC in 1992. Okay. Long time ago. <laughs> yes. It's really beautiful if you go back now. You should go visit. Yes. Well, I was there uh, three or four years ago, but I have changed a lot of the mm -hmm. places. Uh, but it was, was nice. It's a nice place. It was one of my best experiences, uh, professional experiences in life was that time that I, I spent there. Yes. It's a pretty neat place. Yes. Min, where, where are you located, Min? I'm, I'm in China now. Oh. It seems like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's on the other side of the, the planet. It seems like uh, a lot of you are in the U.S. right now. No, I am in Barcelona. Barcelona. Mm -hmm. yes. And I'm, I'm in New York. New York, which means it's almost midnight. It's midnight in New York. Uh, yeah, almost one o'clock. Oh, yeah. Actually, yeah. One o'clock. Yeah. Oh my god! It's coming. What time is in China? It's uh, one one p.m. Oh, um, just past one p.m. Oh, so wow. it's you know, it's good time. <laughs> yes, it's morning in Barcelona. <laughs> we have the twenty-four hours. <laughs> we do at ten. 10 p.m. in Stanford, <laughs> uh, 7 p.m. in Barcelona, 1 a.m. in New York, and 1 p.m. in China. We got it covered. We got the world covered. Indeed. <laughs> yes. Well, this is a very challenging organization because they have 900 speakers uh, you know the day all around the world at uh, different hours. It's very, very crazy uh, organization. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's quite an undertaking to, to make this all happen. Yes. I mean, hats off to the organizers. Yes, yes. No, and to have simultaneous uh, activities at the same time, and uh, it's it's uh, challenging. Mm. Because uh, on uh, on live when they, they organize in Estoril in Portugal, it's uh, very nice, but it's also a lot of simultaneous activities. But here to do the same uh, online is a challenge. 
Well, it seems like um, a lot of different technologies are springing up to treat to deal with these. Do you guys yes. use any one in particular that you has worked well for you? Well, uh, I'm working more of the time with Zoom and uh, doing uh, webinars and this kind of thing using Zoom. Uh, sometimes using others, but uh, the the most um, useful in my case is uh, the using of Zoom. It's uh, I am using more than any other one. Hmm. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. Sorry. Hello Ken. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. How's everyone nice doing? Very good, thank you. Well, where are you calling from? Delaware. It's uh, 1 15 a.m. Yeah. Four hours too much that time. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get too thank much sleep nowadays. Where are you guys all from? The lawyers from Stanford, of course. Yeah, I'm here in New York. New York? Oh, okay. Right yeah. here on the same time zone. We're in the same time zone, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I'm in and I'm in California. California. Yeah. And I'm in Barcelona and Spain. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'll, I'll come with you, please. <laughs> with, uh, where are you in China, I mean? Well, I'm in Beijing. Oh, okay. Wow, that's a bright and shiny afternoon. And Grace is also in California. Mm hmm Okay. I thought 10 p.m. was late. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, Grace, what do you guys work with? Uh, so I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford, and I am associate CMO for Stanford Children's Health. Um, and I I spend a lot of time thinking about COVID vaccines right now. <laughs> oh my goodness! Right, I have three kids, the right person. seven month old, and uh, oh, okay. five, yeah, thank you, five years old. So. I think about that every day, and I want them to go back to school. You see, there's a quiet, a quietness. It's very rare nowadays. <laughs> yeah, three kids. You have a full house. Yeah, my goodness. So work hard, work fast. All of us. <laughs> yes. I mean, do you also work with uh, medical stuff? Yeah, I'm more on the VC side on healthcare. Um, and yeah, just like looking at in, uh, investment opportunities, and you know, currently it's you know pretty. Uh, there are a lot of changes post COVID. Yeah. yeah. So do you, do you look at a wide variety of investments, or mostly healthcare? Uh, mostly healthcare, but sometimes other stuff too. And I was actually I had to change my title because I was before uh, before the meeting um, a couple of months ago. I was like doing we we were trying to like incubate. Uh, e-commerce platform on, on, on uh, health products, and because of COVID, we had to like, um, like sort of, sort of, kind of re, re, sort of uh, redirect ourselves to, um, to other investment opportunities and incubation opportunities. Hmm. So, has it been more opportunities now from from COVID coming along, but different, or is it kind of slow to opportunities overall? I, th I think for cross-border opportunities, it def definitely uh, slowed down a lot. But for uh, technology in uh, investment and just uh, research development perspective, it's actually doing quite well. A lot of people are getting more uh, health conscious and investors are, they, they know they're, they're emphasized again by the importance of healthcare. So, uh, so overall, it's an it's a, it's a upward curve for healthy healthcare investment. It's a good time. Interesting time too. Yeah, people have commented about how it's a silver lining and the, especially if, uh, uh, telemedicine will start to advance. The acceptance of you know, people not having to go to the doctor anymore and they have been forced to use you know, the telephone uh, or the computer rather, um, that that's gonna maybe create a whole new growth of opportunities in healthcare. Do you guys share that, share that view? Yeah. We definitely um, there's there's a lot of uh, um, there are a lot of like previous investments in telemedicine and and unfortunately telemedicine has been like slowly adopt being adopted, but because of COVID it just accelerated the process by ten times. People are forced to use that 
people are forced to stay home and see a doctor. And after that, you know, the following is like, oh, your doctor prescribed the drug. So they have to like, and then e-commerce, uh, like on, on the drug, on, on the medicine side also, um, you know, has to like pick, has to like match the demand. Uh, so the whole, the whole sort of ecosystem has evolved into a, into uh, extend that that we we've never imagined it would happen that quick. Hmm. Are you guys doing the same thing in Europe and and on the West Coast? Sorry. Uh, does the U.S. China poli geopolitics affect some of that uh, uh, investment activity? Hello. Yeah. Sorry, I can't hear. Somebody's sorry, it got cut off a little bit. Oh, yeah. no, he was asking, does it, it's like, um, the U.S. opportunity and is that is that impacted the U.S. China relationship impacted that? Got it, got it. I mean, definitely is. I mean, a lot of VCs stopped uh, or slowed down investment into the U.S. and and I, I I don't know if you have heard of the TikTok cases and uh, Huawei and everything. There's just a lot of bans currently, you know, because countries are, are, they need to take care of themselves and, and be, you know, for the purpose of national security. So a lot, of, a lot of countries impose a lot of restrictions on foreign investments and foreign countries operating in their own countries. It, it, it's, just, it's just a very uncertain time to do cross-border and do to cross-border operation or investments. So, so far, a lot of, like, most of the energy is spent on, on, on domestic market, looking at um, what, what, what is the room, right? There's telemedicine, there's a lot of things. There are a lot of new themes coming up because of COVID. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. And also, Lloyd, by the way, thanks for uh, passing along. So I'm uh, in touch with the uh, folks in your uh, school next week. We just delivered four units to Yale School of Medicine Infectious Diseases. So I'm hoping we can we can take a lead. Um, we have about 21 hospitals, university hospitals around the world that we hope to aggregate all the uh, biospecimens data. So, it's, so Johns Hopkins is doing the data aggregation per se. So we want to do the biospecimen aggregation per se plus data. So with uh, partners from West Coast will help us a lot. So really appreciate it. Oh, I'm glad it worked out. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, it took us like 16 emails to find the time to talk. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, everyone is busy now, now I, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I think so. Yeah. I'm glad you connected. Yeah. Are you guys doing a lot of trials now at, at the school or any special uh, initiative about COVID? Yeah, I mean, we have a we, we have a couple of repurposed antivirals. We just finished a trial with um, with Lambda Interferon. We have another trial with uh, Favipiravir. Uh, we have yet another repurposed antiviral. It's in a process of going through uh, FDA, IND, and then we're participating in in several industry supported trials as well on both the monoclonal antibodies as well as uh, hopefully we'll be participating in two vaccine trials. No. So yeah, that's very busy. And what about some of the cancer drugs that before COVID we were following Ron Levy uh, with Ron uh, Ron Levy and his yeah. uh, study that was pretty cool. We have uh, um, our chief radiologist from Karolinska. So Ron Levy does you know you go with uh, radiation and then um, uh, then the immunotherapy that was. We're falling very close, but then did the COVID stop all that? Or? No, I mean, there's still cancer trials going on. Um, you know, therapeutic treatment trials were, were never interrupted, or if they were, very transiently. A normal subject, normal human subject trials are, you know, have been by and large on hold, but they're, they're starting to get going again. Mm. Oh, great. Uh, it was, uh, the whole clinical trial, uh, at least some of our collaborators here at UPenn, just completely stopped. That was very worrisome. And some of the surgery even becomes elective surgery, <laughs> and everybody's yeah. weak now. That was, that was very worrisome. Yeah, we went through a period in March and, and April when elective surgeries were deferred. Mm -hmm. but we 
back full speed since about April 22nd. Mm, mm, that's great. One. Great. So I guess we uh, we start here in about five minutes, I think, at half past the hour. Uh, let's see. So I, I, I know that we've, I connected Fahim with um, the technical support person, and I gather you can hear me, but you still can't see me. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So supposedly they're working on that. They're also working on um, Fahim. Uh, see if. But I, I can see you just fine. Oh, you can? Yeah. You can? Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Huh. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? I can see Grace, Brad, uh, uh, me. I can see everyone just fine. Huh. So we have everybody here, right? We have everybody. Yep. Is it five plus one? Six people. It's, that's everybody. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, Ken, can you see Fahim? I can't. Okay. I think they're working on. Uh, so what they did was to send me a link to click uh, on. Fahim uh, is, but uh, I, we don't see him. Yeah. Can you hear us? Question. Uh -huh. Someone's okay. requesting a mic. Okay, so I'll accept. <laughs> Hello? Oh, okay. So let's see if I. Oh. Huh. So was that a was that a viewer who was requesting to speak to someone? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Mark, Mark uh, Mueller Everstein. Yeah, Mark. Ah, Mark. Okay. Maybe it's my mistake. Mark, help, uh, thanks for uh, helping to organize all that uh, on Davos group every year. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I got a message from uh, from Janty saying that they can see me, so that's a good thing. Uh, Janty, any progress on getting uh, Fahim on? You can look at the screen. And uh, Fahim, can you hear us? If you can hear us, Fahim, could you send us a message? Hmm. Hmm. So, was the session supposed to start at ten fifteen? I thought it was. Yeah. But Yeah, so I think we're supposed to be going now. <laughs> we are kind of going now, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start. I think, we think, we think, I, I think, I think it's already live. Like I see, I see a live uh, and a green icon. It means oh, okay. that. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot yeah. of attendees now, so. Mm. Okay, well, maybe we should go ahead and get started then. Mm -hmm. um, Good morning, good evening, everyone who's joining, uh, and good afternoon uh, for those in Asia. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this panel on vaccines, and I'm just going to make, I'm Lloyd Minor, Dean of Medicine at Stanford. I'll make a few introductory remarks and then ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. We have a very distinguished international panel today. It goes without saying that, that COVID-19 has really upended the world and we're all very hopeful for a vaccine. And we'll hear from some experts today about progress towards the development and deployment of that vaccine. And as of this Monday, there were 11 potential vaccines in phase three trials around the world and 42 vaccines that are in earlier stage trials. 
So a lot of shots on goal and a lot of activity in terms of different methods of uh, re different methods of antibody production and of uh, hopefully generating an immune response. And we'll discuss more about that during during the panel. So let me turn now uh, to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. And uh, let me start um, with Jose Ramon. Uh, would you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Uh, good morning in my case. Uh, good afternoon and good evening for all, all the people who are in the U.S. I'm a <clears throat> actually, I'm a retired professor of health education. And actually, I'm a strategic advisor of Barcelona Supercomputing Center and also working in the Institute of International Cooperation from the Royal European Academy of Doctors in Barcelona. Thank you very much. And Ken, would you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ken Hu. I'm the founder and the CEO of Countwell. Countwell developed a, um, essentially an electronic node for, in, for domain experts, a DC, DC MEMS device that detects cancer as well as COVID, as you might have already heard at the uh, Helsinki uh, airport, uh, dogs are deployed to sniff out uh, COVID. We have deployed our technology in one trial and uh, I think 99% sensitivity will be published in New England Journal of Medicine. And we're hoping that our technology will continue to deploy in airports, uh, factories, schools, not uh, three kids, so I want them to go back to school as soon as possible. <laughs> uh, and of course, for your family and mine. Thank you. Thank you. Brett, would you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm Brett Johnson. I'm here in New York. Uh, I'm co-founder and CEO of the All True Institute, which is a think tank focused on big, complex problems. Uh, oops. Oh. Hey, I think I think we lost Brett. Hopefully, we'll we'll get him back. Um, Grace, would you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Sure, thank you. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine, associate chief medical officer at Stanford Children's Health, and I'm a member of the U.S. Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, oh, or ACIP, uh, which is a federal advisory committee yeah. that uh, provides recommendations for vaccine use in the U.S. civilian population. Thank you. Thank you. Brett, uh, we'll go back to you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I guess I got cut off there. Uh, so the virus project is about to launch, and essentially it's a, a communications platform that tries to bring together all the people in the world trying to address this COVID issue. Obviously, vaccine is one of the components, but we also focus on testing and treatments and, and the containment of disease. So that's what we're, uh, we're doing here. My background has been in running investment conferences for uh, emerging healthcare life science companies. Okay, thank you, Brad. And uh, Min, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm very grateful of this opportunity to speak with such a wonderful group of panelists uh, and share my view on, on vaccines for COVID-19. My name is Min, uh, a Schwarzman scholar and an entrepreneur in residence at Northern Light Venture Capital. Uh, it's, it's a venture capital fund based in Beijing that, that manages about $4 billion uh, US, do US dollars. Um, and we, we invest um, a lot in healthcare and we primarily look at uh, IVDs and um, innovation, innovative drugs. Um, and since COVID, we have shifted our strategies um, quite a bit. And I would love to share anything um, that about you know investing in, in venture capital. And, and yeah, it's a very special time. And, and I would love to learn from other panelists about the development of the vaccine. And, and I'm just, I'm here to learn. Great, thank you. We do have one other panelist. We're experiencing some technical difficulties. Hopefully that will uh, get fixed, but uh, we hope that uh, Fahim Yunus will be joining us as soon as uh, the technical challenges. So let's, let, let's, ah, very good. Amen. How are you? Very good. Thank you very much. I don't know whoever did whatever. Thank you. Whoever helped me gain access to the matrix. Okay, well, could you introduce yourself, please?
né? Uhum. Uh, uh, Fahim, we, we, so sorry. Can you introduce yourself, please? I think your microphone may be mute. Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, this is Fahim Yunus. I'm the chief quality professor of medicine here at University of Maryland. I'm an infectious disease doctor by trade for the past 20 years. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and get started with, uh, with some questions for if you have people to mute if they're not speaking. But great, thank you. Let's go ahead and get started with some questions for our panelists. And uh, first, maybe a question to Brett and to Ken. Um, we certainly would all welcome an announcement of a vaccine, but there are certain pitfalls along the way. And could you discuss some of those pitfalls and what you're watching out for in terms of the deployment of vaccines and maybe a little bit about what we're going to learn from the COVID experience that will help us in the development of future vaccines? Hmm. All right, so I guess I can take that. Um, I'm not sure I'm quite as big an expert as you guys or other, others are on the vaccine itself development, but I'm really more in trying to be an observer as to what's going on. And I think one of the interesting developments, um, I think is gonna be some of these treatments, these pseudo vaccines, like Regeneron's recent announcement just yesterday, I think, on the effectiveness they've had in terms of a, a drop in the viral load. And so some of my analyst friends are, are thinking that, that that along with Eli Lilly's efforts um, could really create uh, something very promising, not, not exactly a vaccine, but you know some very effective treatments. Um, and we're seeing some other things in our research of other you know, uses of, of other drug cocktails that have enabled people to um, you know, enter a hospital. One study we looked at, you know, they've had 30 patients enter in sequentially, um, and they would normally expect you know, four or five deaths from you know, of those who are hospitalized. And they've, in this case, they've, they've had none. So there's so much going on in, I think, the treatment side that that's very helpful. Um, I mean, on the vaccine side, you know, my concerns are, you know, the speed on, on, on the acceptance of people willing to, willingness to even take a drug, um, given, you know, the, the general sentiment for sort of the anti-vax thing and, and just general resistance on, on the potential risks. Um, so I, I think that's going to be one of the big challenges is, is just the, the willingness and the, sort of the trust level that may exist among people willing to actually take, take drugs. And, and the development of some of these other treatments that are, are, are going to become so effective. Um, so if I might also offer my humble opinion. <laughs> so I come from a completely different background, focus on disease detection and diagnostics. Um, I will uh, answer the question by the <laughs> question where my wife asked me. Uh, did I take my seven-month-old child to get a new COVID vaccine? And what if, and also uh, the bigger picture, what if not enough people is taking the vaccine? And what if the vaccine that is thought to be safe is not? Those are some concerns. Myself do not have the expertise to answer. And I certainly salute, uh, salute to the scientists around the world who's working on it, uh, like in, um, uh, such as COVID vaccine, uh, is and very important, but uh, maybe a part of condition for what we can rely on. And I would say that a COVID specific vaccine cannot address the next pandemic. Which my product sooner than later. Um, so I I am a bit uh, biased <laughs> since our company did our test. So we saw in combination a um, a very low cost product, um, and it and reliable one of course is very much necessary. And we're hoping that our our test can. Uh, be available for people for less than five dollars or even less than a dollar. And also, I think, um,
from the test is, you know, can developed country uh, or developing country afford these tests, right? So I come from a humble family in southern China. Um, you know, developing countries cannot afford these $25 to $100 uh, tests. Uh, even developed countries, how often do we need to test our population? Do we test everyone every time we go to a grocery store? Do I test my uh, five years old daughter every time she comes back from school because my dad is uh, diabetic for 25 years, right? So a lot of these questions, pressing questions that I'm very much hoping that we could somehow contribute to this discussion. Um, essentially our company uh, developed a um, electronic nose. You might have heard that uh, uh, airport in Helsinki is using dogs to sniff cancer, uh, uh, COVID. And you also heard before COVID, dogs were used to sniff uh, out cancer. So what we were able to develop is a, a gadget, which or hardware that can replicate dogs' nose, but more sensitivity as uh, low parts per trillion, and also cloud-based. So you instead of training 100,000 dogs, we train two of our devices and then the whole network of devices around the world that deployed uh, is learned to detect COVID, to cancer and so on. And these being developed, deployed in universities, uh, meat packing plants, airports and so on. So we're hoping to scale up this continuously at very low cost and make it uh, effective. And we certainly hope uh, our company and our uh, contribution is to bring uh, my kids back to school, my wife back to work, and your kids, your your family and friends, back to some sense of normalcy. And uh, hopefully, we get there soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ken. Maybe a next question to Dr. Grace Lee. Uh, Grace, can you share the key considerations that the CDC's advisory committee on vaccines is taking into account? as these multiple phase three trials are working their way through the approval process? Sure, I thank you for the question. Um, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, just a, a brief overview, it's got 15 members, 33 liaison organizations, and eight ex officio members uh, representing the federal agencies. And we began a COVID vaccine work group as early as April and a separate vaccine safety technical subgroup uh, in June, and we've been holding open public meetings on a monthly basis since June. So the deliberations to date have primarily focused on understanding the burden of COVID-19 disease in at-risk populations, such as healthcare workers, essential workers, adults with high-risk medical conditions, and the older adult population. We've been discussing approaches to maximize the benefits of a vaccination program, given the um, anticipated limited supply during the early phases of vaccination. And we've also been explicitly discussing how to incorporate principles of equity, justice, and fairness into our process. You know, we are, we are eagerly awaiting the data on efficacy and safety from the phase three clinical trials in order to finalize our recommendations about use of COVID vaccines for the public. Um, one other point um, I'd just like to emphasize is that ACIP has been preparing to monitor post authorization or post licensure vaccine safety as we feel this will be really critical to support a dynamic decision-making process, particularly because we anticipate multiple new vaccines will become available with time, which adds to the complexity of decision-making. Great, thank you very much. Maybe a next question to um, Jose, Min, and Fahim. And even once a vaccine is available and receives emergency use authorization, uh, there still are questions about who will take the vaccine and, and the level of trust in the public uh, in the vaccines, in this particular vaccine and vaccines in general. Maybe each of us could give us your thoughts and your perspective from the work that you're doing on what needs to be done to increase the public trust. I'm going to keep it mute, um, to the mute when people are not speaking. That, thank you very much. And uh, maybe we start with Jose and then Min and then Fahim. But Jose, go ahead. Thank you. I think that one of the big problems that we have uh, in all over the world with the vaccines in general is that probably as using a phrase of uh, Dr. Barry Bloom from the Harvard University, it's that, that uh, the most important ingredient in all the vaccines are the, is trust. 
and then uh, if you don't have trust, uh, you have a problem. And probably uh, there are uh, in several polls shown that uh, 50 percent of Americans uh, are saying that they would accept a COVID vaccine, uh, and uh, we probably will need to protect 60, 70 percent of the population to have a herd immunity. In Spain, for example, uh, approximately 40, 45 percent of the people has uh, shown that they, they will accept the vaccine. Especially when you receive that the first news that we have here, for example, in Europe, is the the first vaccine approved has been the Sputnik from Russia, and obviously they have no uh, put in all the faces that is supposed to do. Uh, now the people are concerned. They are actually uh, probably the most important uh, group of uh, uh, organizations working on vaccines in the world is the uh, Covax. Uh, they're working as a, as a group of people led by Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, Gavi, the Alliance, uh, Vaccine Alliance and the World Health Organization. And they are working in 172 countries. And then I think that when this kind of organization shown that they have a, a vaccine that could be recommended, most of the people will trust on them. But the question is uh, separated like the Russian did. Uh, only, okay, we have a vaccine that is ready to be ad administered and they uh, they skip all the phases that normally did. It's uh, complicated to have the people trust in. And then I think that this will be one of the problems that we will have in the near future with the uh, uh, vaccine that's coming from Moderna, from uh, AstraZeneca, Johnson, etc. Totally agree. Um, something I would want to add is that I would say trust comes with understanding. You understand a thing first and then you trust it based on your understanding of it. Um, so in my opinion, I think um, the people people don't have enough understanding of the, the vaccine. And it's a complicated thing, right? How can you simplify the thing? How, how can you simplify the development and, and teach, educate the general population about you know the mechanism of action and why it makes what makes it safe right what makes it unsafe and some of the drugs that, that are you know they're already approved in the market they may they may have skipped a clinical trial phase three and if you understand that you know better than you, you understand it enough then you know that maybe it's not safe right and when all the other uh, the candidates pass all the clinical trials pass through all these you know safety um, evaluations, assessments, and everything. Then, then the government needs needs to stand stand out and really um, control, not control, but like you know, really like create a messaging channel and to 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 educate the general population uh, about the vaccine, so the general pop population will understand it. So, my my metric is that as long as my grandma understands it and it's doing a good job. Because the general public, not everybody is scientists. They have their own job. They have their have their own professional. So this this thing has to be really grounded. Um, that's my point one. Second is that even if the vaccine itself it's safe, but there's so much in between before the drug gets to uh, the vaccine gets to the general population. There's storage. There's transportation. There's you know the right administration, and there's no like contamination in any of any of the the these, these uh, steps. So we need to make sure that these steps are taken care uh, carefully. Yeah, that's that's all I want to add. Great, thank you. And Fahim? First of all, I completely agree with what Grace said, Jose Min, you know, they're right on the spot. First is I tried to measure this mistrust myself. I tweeted and about 7,000 people, I asked a question, will you take this vaccine? And 7,000 people took that poll and 30% said that they wouldn't. In US, those numbers are again, one in three people say that they won't. In the world, it's one in four of 25%. So the mistrust is clearly there. We have measured it. I think the way to deal with it is again, like my colleagues said, number one, media needs to slow down the hype and sensationalism. It may not be the best. This is a turtle and a hare race. The turtle may be the best hare. So we have to, number one, not sensationalize it. Speed doesn't matter. This is not a race to the moon. Accuracy matters. 
Number two, I believe government. They need to swim in their lane. When politician comes and puts certain timelines ahead of people, it it, it creates nervousness. Uh, and then number three, I think vaccine companies as well. They have to be very forthright. I was actually quite pleased when the Oxford company came out and talked about that side of it publicly. To me, that generates trust. Yes, it starts with angst, but if you handle it well and you remain transparent, it will continue to generate trust. My last point is, like Min was saying, it's too premature for us to start making promises. One of the cafeteria lady where I work in the hospital, the other day, I a vaccine, and she said, I'll turn in my badge and I will leave this job, but I will not take it if someone mandates it. I didn't say anything. Grab my food, kept on chit-chatting. And you know what? After 30 seconds, what she said, she said, Dr. Yunus, will you take it? Because if you, then I'm okay with it. It just takes time. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Maybe this next question for, for Grace and for Jose. Um, Grace in the United States, Jose in, in Spain. Uh, COVID-19 has disproportionately affected certain communities, communities of color, uh, communities where uh, it's difficult to isolate for people who are infected, uh, communities that have challenges with the social environmental determinants of health. Perhaps you could describe, Grace, you in the ni United States, and, and Jose, if you could describe in Spain, what measures are being taken to distribute the vaccine in an equitable way, and in particular to take into account the disproportionate effect and burden of this disease in certain populations, and how will that impact the distribution of the vaccine once one does get approved by a regulatory agency? Grace, would you start? Sure. It's a really thoughtful and challenging question you ask. <laughs> um, and we've been talking about race and ethnicity as central to many of our discussions around um, vaccine use. Um, but as has been highlighted by others, the disparities we're seeing with COVID-19 disease really reflect the health, environmental, and occupational effects of structural racism. So in order to reduce those disparities we're seeing in the U.S., I think we need to shift the focus from individual characteristics to communities that are affected by structural racism. Um, we can incorporate equity into our vaccine recommendations, but that won't be enough. It's really about how well we can implement each phase of the vaccine program that will determine our ability to impact those disparities um, over time. So um, it, it's gonna require all of us. It's not you know, just recommendations. It's very much gonna be so dependent on our, our um, programs around implementation. Thank you, Jose. In yes, Spain, Jose. what have you think? Well, here in Spain, uh, as we are part of the European Union, uh, all, all the, uh, the politics are around the, the European Union and everyone has more or less the same uh, attitude about that. Uh, the idea is that the uh, European Union will uh, has signed uh, an agreement with uh, several pharmaceutical companies who are producing to guarantee that every at the same time, every uh, on the same day that they will release the vaccine, uh, all the Europeans will have access to the vaccine. Obviously, they they, they need to prioritize, and then probably they have talked uh, talking that the first will be the healthcare system workers and then people uh, in high risk like a third age or people who has all their problems uh, but i think that here uh, we have uh, different problems that other part of the world that probably they will have also uh, difficulties to reach uh, the the vaccine when they will be ready uh, and then another point that i would like to to talk about it's not only uh, the, the problem that we have here with uh, the distribution of their vaccine, but also the problem that is uh, appearing in, in Spain and other countries. It's uh, about the, the decline of the number of children receiving um, uh, vaccines uh, of all other type of vaccines uh, in, uh, because of the pandemic and because uh, the disruption of uh, this uh, kind of uh, programs of immunization with all other type of vaccine, for example, the DTP3 coverage, etc., has declined. And probably we will have also problems related to the pandemic, not because of COVID, but the other uh, diseases that are affecting children who are not uh, vaccin vaccinated because of that. 
Great. Thank you very much, Jose. Look, we're, we're almost out of time. I'd like to la ask each of our panelists uh, one final question. These past eight to nine months have been an enormous challenge uh, for virtually everyone in the world. Um, indeed, I think uh, a greater challenge than than in almost any of us have experienced in, in our lifetimes in terms of its impact and its extent. Um, do you see a silver lining? Can each of you think of and identify a silver lining uh, moving forward? Just very briefly, since I think we've got about four minutes left. Men, could we get started with you? What do you see as a silver lining? I think you're muted, Min, sorry. Sorry, I'm muted. <laughs> uh, silver linings, I, I definitely see there are a lot of silver linings. With a challenge like this, um, there are, it comes up with more opportunities. And just the first silver lining is healthcare. Uh, people are more conscious uh, in their health. And we're seeing a huge increase in, in the purchase of uh, private health insurance in China. It means a lot because people used to pay a lot of um, their medical expenditures out of pocket. It used That number used to be 40% out of the total healthcare expenditure. And over the COVID period, um, we're seeing a, a quick reduction of out-of-pocket um, health expenditure. Um, and a lot of people are purchasing private health insurance. Uh, it's a good thing. Um, that's number one. Second is there's more investment going into uh, healthcare technology, meaning innovative drugs, meaning medical technologies. Um, and overall, I think the healthcare industry in the next decade, I think it benefits greatly from this period. And I do think it has a lasting um, lasting impact on, on the industry. And second, it boosts uh, industries around anything around working at home. Like imagine you have to like stay home and work. So it means that you have to, to, to exercise. So home gym, really blooms and you imagine you need to buy groceries. So online shopping from groceries also blooms. So, so it's, you know, with the, with, unfortunately, you know, COVID, you know, creates a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a challenge, right? For the, for, for humanity. But uh, we are seeing we are seeing people um, there, there's, there's, there's definitely silver linings. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Grace, silver linings that you see. Uh, thanks. Uh, just briefly, I think uh, COVID forces us to break down our usual usual silos. We have to think creatively. We have to problem solve. So a perfect example of that in the healthcare delivery system has been around telehealth and the use of telehealth to really um, care for patients. But for me, the other silver lining is that by forcing us to confront health equity as a core issue, um, I am hopeful that the pandemic will help us to actually rebuild our systems in order to better care for and ensure access to health for all people. That's my silver lining. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Brett, what's your silver lining? Um, well, briefly, I would say acceleration of technology. I mean, this is an example today is, is that, you know, in the olden days, we would sort of wait till find a time when we could meet at a conference, for example. Uh, today, we can have meetings instantaneously. So I think there could be an acceleration of the advance of technology because people are connecting right away. I mean, for example, there's six of us on the, on the line here that we never would have ever met otherwise than something like this. So I think that's going to be the silver lining. Great. Thank you. Uh, Fahim, silver lining? Everything that Grace already said, telemedicine, healthcare equity, <laughs> I think of semi-private rooms are going to be gone. People who are much more conscious about sharing bathrooms, sharing spaces. But I think we're right all on the same money. In the interest of time, I'll stop there. Thank you. Jose? Oh, you're muted. Jose, sorry. Uh, very brief. Only for a message for the politician. Don't cut off in education. Don't cut off in the health care system and uh, in research. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Ken? Um, I think COVID helped us to prepare for the next one. Um, I think humanity got the dry run. This is not the worst. And hopefully no worse than this will come. But if anything comes, we're much better prepared as a team, as a village. 
Great. Well, thank you all. A very distinguished panel and a great discussion. And to those of you who joined us uh, this evening, this morning, this afternoon, thank you for joining us. Be safe. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah, everyone. Thank you, Lloyd. Bye bye. Appreciate thank it. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Have we turned this thing off? Let me turn it off for you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.